Hi everyone, today we'll be going over chapter 2 of Physics for the MCAT, which covers work and energy. Chapter 2.1 is about the different types of energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and its specific value is given by the equation K for kinetic energy equals one half of mass times velocity squared. And K is given in units of joules, which is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And this is the unit for all energy. Potential energy, on the other hand, is related to position in space. So there's gravitational potential energy, which is equal to U equals mgh, where m is the mass of the object, g is the gravitational constant, which is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared, and h is the height of the object, which is in meters. Elastic potential energy is the potential energy that is stored in springs. So all springs have an equilibrium position where it is if you don't do anything to it. And the potential energy comes into play when you stretch or compress it to a certain distance. So X is the displacement from equilibrium, either stretching or compressing. K is a particular spring constant, and this is multiplied by one half. So the elastic potential energy is one half times the spring constant, times the displacement from equilibrium squared. The sum of all mechanical energy that an object has is called total mechanical energy, and it's denoted by the letter E, which is equal to all of the potential energy plus all of the kinetic energy. It's often more helpful to think about this in terms of the change in mechanical energy. So if something happens to this object, the change in mechanical energy is equal to the change in potential energy plus the change in kinetic energy. So there's a concept called conservative forces. And basically what it means for something to be conservative force is that it doesn't change the amount of total mechanical energy an object has. So how you know if a certain force is a conservative force is that there are two possible scenarios. First, if you go in a particular path, if it ends up at the same point, you know that all of the forces were conservative because the total mechanical energy didn't change. And this is true no matter what path you take. So you can take any kind of wild path you want. If it ends up at the same point, you know that this was a conservative force. The other way you know if something's a conservative force is that if you take two different paths to reach from one point to another point, these two paths have different distances, they have different ways of getting there, but they end up at the same point anyway. So in this case, you can take this first path or the second path, and they would both end up at this exact same place, which means that the path that this conservative force took didn't affect the amount of total mechanical energy. So this would be a conservative force. And when something is a conservative force, this means that the change in mechanical energy, which is equal to what we discussed earlier, is equal to zero. So there was no change in total mechanical energy. But when there are non-conservative forces, such as friction or loss of heat, you have a different equation. And this is in order to find the amount of non-conservative work, this is equal to the change in total mechanical energy, which is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy, and this is not equal to zero because you've lost some mechanical energy now to friction or heat. Chapter 2.2 is about work, and the definition of work is energy transferred from one system to another through the course of movement. The equation for work is work equals force times distance. And since these are vectors, in order to transfer these to a scalar quantity, we can write that force times distance times cosine theta is equal to work. What this cosine theta term specifically means is that work is only relevant when it is applied in the same direction as or in the opposite direction as the movement of an object. So if we have a block here moving to the right, if I apply a force directly to the right, this would cause positive work. And if I apply a force directly this way, this would cause a negative work. However, if I apply a force downward, this would not cause any work at all. Because even if I apply a force downward, the object is not going to move downward. It's against the floor. 
If I apply force in a diagonal direction, this force would only apply the amount of work that's in the x direction. And so this is why this cosine theta term is there. Another type of work is pressure and volume work. So if we consider a piston, this piston can move down to compress something or it can move up to decrease the pressure on something. So the amount of work applied in this system is work equals pressure multiplied by the change in volume. So if we were to apply, apply the system to a graph where the y-axis is pressure and the x-axis is volume, the amount of work is, if we have an initial state to a final state, the amount of work is the amount of area under this graph. Power is defined as work over time. So if you can do 10 joules of work, that's a quantity of work. But if you can do 10 joules of work per second, that's different from being able to do 10 joules of work for every hour. So this is a measure of power. And work over time is also a measure of change in energy over time. And so power can tell you how much energy you're managing to transfer over a certain quantity of time. And this is measured in watts, which is joules over seconds. The work energy theorem states that the net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And this makes sense because if you're doing work on a certain object, you're causing it to move somewhere, which is causing it to have a change in kinetic energy. And this change in kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Now to figure this out, you might need one of these equations or any combination of these equations based on what you're given in the problem. So it might be helpful to know that work is equal to force times distance times cosine theta in order to find the first term, network. Or it might be helpful to know that kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times velocity squared in order to find the final and initial kinetic energy. Chapter 2.3 is about mechanical advantage, and mechanical advantage is what you can gain by using simple machines. Simple machines don't require any input of electricity or energy. They just offer a mechanical advantage. So you'll see what I mean. For example, this wedge offers a mechanical advantage and it's a simple machine because you don't need any energy to have this wedge be a wedge. But if you've ever moved anything into a moving truck or anything up a certain distance, you know that it's easier to move something up an inclined slope than it is to move something directly upwards. So this is why you use a ramp in order to move something up to a moving truck instead of just trying to lift it. Another type of mechanical advantage is a lever or the seesaw. So it's easier to lift something with a lever than it is just trying to lift it with your hands. The definition of mechanical advantage is the force that is outputted divided by the force that is inputted. So the more force you get out per unit of force you put in, the more advantageous your machine is. And something else that is important about mechanical advantages or about simple machines is that there's something called a load distance as well as an effort distance. So the load distance is how far your load moves or the thing you're trying to move moves and the effort distance is how much effort you actually had to put into it in order to make it move. So in the, in the example of this lever, if you had something really heavy on this side, that's maybe 10 kilograms, you can lift this with as little force as one kilogram. If this one kilogram force was one tenth of the distance, as we learned last time, with the example of torque. So if this one kilogram force was one meter away and this 10 kilogram force was 10 meters away, these would balance out exactly. So you can imagine that if you applied only a little bit of force very close to the fulcrum, this would cause a lot of force to be outputted on this heavier thing on the other side. Another example of a simple machine is a pulley. So how a pulley works is that it's secured on the ceiling and it also has something here that can turn. So something is holding the load up and if you pull here, you can pull a certain amount of distance to cause 
the load to go up a certain distance. And the pulley is not exactly as efficient in terms of mechanical advantage as this fulcrum is. However, the pulley can make it easier to pull the load upwards because this load is being supported by the ceiling as well. So it wouldn't feel as heavy to your arm in order to pull it upwards. The efficiency of a machine is equal to work out divided by work in. And this is also equal to the load times the load distance divided by the effort times the effort distance. So in the case of the pulley, the load is this one kilogram block and the effort is the effort that you exert in order to pull it upwards by pulling downwards. So in this case, the effort distance is twice as much as the load distance. Because, for example, if you pull one meter downward, this would cause only a half meter upward. And this is because if you pull one meter downward here, half of this meter is on the left side of the string and half of this meter is on the right side of the string. So the load would only move a half meter upwards. However, the efficiency of this isn't necessarily less than one because the amount of effort you put into pulling it downward isn't as much as if you just lifted it upward because it's attached here. So the efficiency of this machine is equal to the load divided by the effort and the effort here would be half the load and the load distance would be half of the effort. So this machine actually doesn't really cause any increase in efficiency, but it causes an increase in mechanical advantage because you have to apply less force in. And this can be helpful because even though you're not doing less total work, it's easier to apply less force over time for a human being who's just trying to pull a string with their arm than it is to apply a very high amount of force over a short amount of time. And this is the end of chapter two, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope that this video helped you.